Um, this last summer, I, uh, I took my incoming seniors on a road trip. And uh, we drive all around the state and we do all sorts of good programmatic ministry that everyone here hates, but I still hold on to because I, I cut my teeth in the 90s and so that's how we roll. Um, and so we did this road trip. We did all these great activities and experiences and we're team building and bonding. And uh, by the second night, we're supposed to be best friends. I have this, this arc that works, and by the second night, we're supposed to be best friends. Um, but they all got, it was just this clicky group, and there was fighting and infighting, and this awkward boyfriend, girlfriend, what they did. It was this whole deal. It was, a, it was just not the emotional thing that I needed as a youth worker, because um, I wasn't really thinking about my kids, because I don't do practical theology or anything. It's about me. And so I did this event, and halfway through, I'm realizing this thing's going down. So I'm like, I know, this is my, my best youth ministry tool. I pull it out, I'm like, what we're going to do is we're going to share our deepest, darkest sins so that everyone can have this emotional experience together and it'll be great. And of course I shaped it like this. Um, hey, you all, we're all clicky, we're all separate because we all think we're too cool and we, we don't put down our guard. And so let's, let's share what's really going on. Let's share who we really are so that we can see in this room we're actually the same. We're not, it's not you and it's not me and it's not you, you do this and I do this, but we'll see and behind your cool guy and cool girl facade, you're just like me struggling with this. And because I'm a veteran youth worker, I thought this is going to be awesome. We're going to talk about cutting and sex and how much they, pot they smoke and why one kid's failing out of school. And I'm like, this is my bread and butter. It's going to be great. And, um, and we start going around the circle and all these beautiful kids with their hip clothes and all of who they are, they all start breaking down crying. But not all the cool stuff I wanted to share. They all started breaking down crying because they're like, I feel so alone. I feel so depressed. I've struggled with anxiety. I had to start taking anxiety meds. I don't know where I fit in. And I'm looking at these kids. And I'm like, you are beautiful. You are hip. Everyone likes you. They don't see that everyone likes them. And they are spun out of control. And as I thought about this... What I thought was interesting, because in that group, there are kids who cut, there are kids who smoke pot, there's kids who deal pot, there's kids who are sleeping together, all in that group. But what's interesting, what's changed, I've noticed in youth ministry, is why in which those things happen. Those things are no longer to be rebellious. They're no longer even for coping mechanisms. It is just simply part of their world. And uh, I love what you said, right, about this practical theology. So instead of just sitting going, what do I do and freak out? Um, there's actually a way to engage that and a way to approach that. And I was actually really thankful that God is still not done with me yet. It allowed me to get my head out of my butt a little bit and go, oh, this is actually for them, not about for you. And uh, we actually had a, a great turnaround event. But I learned a great lesson, which I want to share with you today, which is this idea of a post-Christian model for discipleship. Do you know what this is, Anyone? What? Yeah, it's, I thought it was Walt Disney, but you're right, it's Bill Bright. And um, there was this deal, um, and I'm going to go back just as far as the boomers. There might be people older than the boomers, but I'm not going to go back that far. But the deal is, the way in which we engage the gospel, especially in the evangelical world, has looked, a really, has looked away because of this guy. He tapped into this amazing felt need. And this was the amazing felt need, is we lived in this Judeo-Christian context, and uh, there were all these people, the, the, bust, the builders, you know, they, they fought World War II, they did this stuff, they created this world that was going to be beautiful and perfect, and uh, my water, poor faith. they created this world that was going to be beautiful and perfect, and uh, the boomers rebelled, they're like, F this, man, we don't need that. Sorry for that. So they, they rebelled, they freaked out, all of them, they just went off the deep end, and um, and they knew that there was this version of perfection, and they rebelled against it. And Bill Bright came along and said, oh my goodness, check this out. There's, there's four laws. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for life. But law number two, you are a sinful person. You broke um, God's law. You're sin, right? And you, you, sin means you missed the mark. And every boomer would know they missed the mark. Their parents set a picture of what the mark was. They missed it. And now they knew that if they asked Jesus to forgive their sins... Right? They, would be, they would be forgiven. That debt would be paid. Their rebellion, would, that cost of the rebellion would be covered. And boomers love Bill Bright. I love Bill Bright. I mean, I did cut my teeth on Camp's Crusade. I got my little four little spiritual laws packet. I even gave it to my grandma. That was super awkward. Um, but, but that's Bill Bright. Now, the boomers, you know, they kind of moved on and, um, and, and just wrecked shop for everybody else in the rebellion. And so us Xers and millennials, um, we don't have a picture of perfection anymore. We, this wasn't like, here's the world. We got, you know, this incredible high divorce rate and an incredible high abortion rate and an incredible high just selfish dis, dis destruction. I got some issues with boomers. I'm working out. I'm going to therapy. That's a side note. But what happened is next, but this justification, sin, that didn't really make sense to us. And... Uh, 
this guy came along and just like, oh, got us fired up. Rob Bell, he's so sexy. And, uh, but Rob Bell, he, he, he helped put language for uh, Gen Xers and Millennials and this idea of brokenness and healing and redemption, right? We all hate that we just want to go to heaven someday. We can do whatever we want. God's going to forgive our sins. We're going to go to heaven. No, right? This is God's earth. It's redemptive. God's this redemptive plan. He wants to heal us. He wants to use us in this redemptive plan to bring healing on the earth. Yes, it's so good. It's therapeutic. It's, it's because we have this, we still have a distant memory of how the world could be. It's a distant memory. The boomers jacked it for us, and so we have this like really felt need of, of needing to get fixed. And so we lean into this idea of healing and restoration. And we talk about the gospel and discipleship. It's about you know becoming healed. Jesus uh, being bruised for our iniquities. And, and we're like, yes, this is awesome. And it feels so good. And most people doing youth ministry are boomers and Xers. And so we just, we, we love it. We lay it down in our kids. And this is probably most of our theology. But I'm just going to ask you to think about, um, to differentiate yourself just a little bit. This is you. This is most of us. But think about our, um, the, the digitals. I don't know if that's the name they've landed on. Or that's the one that's around, the X, Y, Z, who knows. But that's what we're calling for today, the digitals. What is their worldview? What is their perception of how things are? And um, I would like to contend that it is not sin, and they're, they're not rebels, and they don't need to be forgiven for their sin, and they're not even broken and need to be healed. I'm sure if you've had this conversation with your students and they get, like, two kids get in a fight, they don't go... Say, say you're sorry and forgive and ask for forgiveness. It's me. This is who I am. This is how I've been made, and you deal with me. This is who they are. They are not sinful. They're not even broken. Now, as mature, godly people from the outside, we're like, you are sinful, and you are broken. But what I would contend is actually they are not. They are alienated, and they are isolated, and they are alone. And so instead of trying to give them this gospel of justification or this gospel of redemption, I'm, I want to at least throw out there and get some feedback from you. If What if the gospel was actually this idea of adoption? Um, and, and to use this family model, we go, but our kids, their families are all jacked up. That doesn't matter. It's a family model. It's, it's a new paradigm in which to communicate the gospel. They, our students, are lost. They do all of those messed up stuff that we got all those books to learn how to deal with, because they, not because they're re- rebels, and not because they're broken, it's because they are lost. That is just simply the world in which they live in. And we have this gospel story of a God who leaves the comforts of heaven, comes to earth, and invades humanity, and meets us on our terms. And thinking about it in a post-Christian discipleship model, what would it look like if we leave our kind of version of Christianity, the gospel that makes sense to us, that matters to us, and to see our kids to show up on their terms, and to find them in their most lostness, and to communicate this story that they have value, that they get to be adopted into this family. It doesn't matter about their current family. It doesn't matter their family of origin. It doesn't, like, whoever they are, they are just lost. They get to be adopted into this family, uh, this God's family. And then when we start talking about discipleship, we actually can, uh, we, we have a framework to move forward. So um, think of it this way. When, when we're adopted into a family, there's, every family still has stories. They have customs. They have manners. And instead of thinking about behavior modification and do this and don't do this, or this is what a good person does and a bad person does, if you're a guest in my home, we eat dinner in a certain way. We, our leaders in there, we prayed in a circle and held hands because that's how I roll. Everyone's like, that's lame, that's Presby. That's how I roll. And, um, but because this is my house. This is my house. But if it was, that's how it is, right? We do that in our own homes. And so what if we begin to think of, of Christendom, the church, youth group, like this is our home. So it's okay to call kids out and have manners and customs and rituals that are godly, that help tell the story. But it's not about behavior modification. It's not about do this to earn favor with God. It's just simply as, as God's people, this is how we interact. This is how we behave. This is what we do. And, 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 we, and we do that. And then the best part is we get to do the things like that Phil's talking about. We take on family values. As my family values certain things. Your family values different things. In God's family, right, we, we take on God's family values of mercy and justice and humility. And, uh, and we get to go do those things, not because it earns favor, but it's taking on the family of God. Oh, crud, I'm running out of time. Okay. So I had a heart-wrenching story, but you're going to miss it. Okay. So... <laughs> Okay, so if we move beyond behavior modification, and this is really hard to do, um, I, I thought about it this way, is what if we start talking about this idea of spiritual formation? And spiritual formation is the idea that we follow Jesus. Like what Phil said, students are all over the spectrum. We want them to start thinking about following Jesus. The next level in discipleship, though, I think, is how do we actually say, 
part of that discipleship process is picking up your cross, dying to yourself, which, it, which, which basically you're inferring that there's some interaction with God. There's some not just me talking to God. It's not just me doing something. It's being reflective, thinking about, working out who is God, who does God call me to do, be, what must I die to, and to begin to move towards Jesus. And uh, back in the good old days, at least in my world, everyone looked like me, acted like me, behaved like me. And if you want to know what being a Christian was, you simply got on this little arrow and you started moving towards Christ, right? This is how it worked for me. You, you, you went to youth group, you, you got rid of your Lance Morissette CD, you bought an audio adrenaline CD, you stopped cussing, and, uh, and then you turned out you had to vote Republican. I didn't even know that, but that's what you had to do. And then you were on this track, and then everyone knew, I'm moving towards Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but the deal is, if you look, and, and it's so funny, that only worked in this tiny sliver of Christianity, but they had all the publishing rights, so we missed out. The reality is, is all of the world has always been more complex than this. It has always been more diverse than this. And so we actually get to embrace that diversity and not just go, in order for you, random kid who has no idea about anything, you need to be like me and then follow me as I follow Jesus, which thanks for the boomers, thanks for that model. Um, we have this different model, which is simply we move towards Jesus. And now every path is unique. Some are closer, some are farther. But now we don't have to, you don't have to be like me. We just simply want people to get on the grid. Wherever you are on the grid, that is awesome. And help students begin to die to themselves, pick up their cross, and move towards Jesus. And I know if you're looking at me, you go, man, Ben, you have so much stuff to work on. I do. I'm working on my top-level stuff, you, it's, but you're like, no, there's other stuff. I know. I can't deal with it yet because I have my stuff that I'm working on. And if you're gracious with me in my way back here working it out, I can be gracious with you, even though I don't understand this part of the spectrum at all, um, as you work it out. Oh, dang. Okay. Do I have one more slide? Oh, I had this killer story. It didn't work. Okay. Okay, so... I just simply wanted to throw that out. I know it was super quick, and it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, from our students, but I just want to at least throw out from your feedback, because I want to make sure I'm not on the crazy train or on the heretic train, um, but just kind of interesting in your feedback as far as the adoption model of the gospel, a family model of discipleship, um, how you see that working out in your context. Do you see kids that just are totally amoral like me, or you have better kids than me? 